Hi, my name is Benedict for Higher Hertz. In this video, we're going to be looking at Slate Digital, the virtual mixing rig thing. Not all the hardware, there is a whole system with hardware and microphone stuff and what have you. It's hardware, so I can't really realistically review it. I don't have it, nor does it look like a thing that I would want or need. Um, if they sent me one over, yeah, I'd have a look at it, but I don't think I'm the right guy to review that because I don't work that way. I don't record bands. Occasionally I record, I record a solo singer, but bands and what have you, not, not my thing. Um, I love mixing them, but I just don't record them. I never never set out to be a recording engineer. Um, it, the virtual microphone thing, I have some serious concerns with any of that kind of virtualization stuff. I think that there is um, a different approach from that which I would take is probably the fairest way of putting it, seeing I haven't actually looked at what he's doing. Um, this is his rack to open up a VST that has a strip, which is these little vertical things. Uh, and you can put, I think it's up to eight of them, six or eight of them, all in a in a line, um, and therefore create your own kind of mixing desk channel kind of thing. Um, it's cool in some ways. I have some concerns in other ways, uh, which we will get into. I will show you it being used just for mastering. We'll go through the main stuff, the goods, the bads, the, the you know what I, what I'm thinking overall, and then if you want to hang in, I've made a whole mix uh, using only the Slate stuff. So again, you can get a little bit more of a, an in-depth for that. I am trying my level best to be very fair, but because of the way some of this stuff is presented, I think it needs to be approached and answered in that form. If you think that's not fair, your business, but I think that when a certain promise is made, a challenge, the way that it's put forward, then that must be addressed. Otherwise, we're kind of, you know, not taking the thing as it's presented. So let's dive straight into listening to something which is mastered just using these four devices, these four doohickeys inside the Slate thing. We can hear, um, oh, if you haven't recognised it, it's the same piece that uh, I used for, uh, for Anna. Uh, it was there, so it was a good start to say, okay, let's just master this thing, because I already knew it from what I've been doing with it. Uh, the AB between in and out is very noticeable, in part because we've got extra level, but we do have more brightness, more presence, all the things that we might want. I would not have a problem with, you know, if I popped this on, went over to somebody's uh, band camp and listened to this, in no way would I think that there was anything wrong with that master at all. I would say, okay, it's doing everything that it should do. So nothing to say that the material or, or the, the device is wrong. It's clearly capable of doing a good job. Just to give you a sense of contrast, if we listen to the same material, I will swap back to my master. Light. Nine. As you hear, very, very similar sorts of results. It's not about which is right or which is wrong, but it's just about showing, hey, Slate's not the only game in town. And I'm saying that not to be mean, but because he presents as though he's the only serious game in town. And, well, I used to sell cars for quite some time. And um, 
There was one manufacturer in particular who traded entirely on their whole, well, we're the coolest and we're the most reliable. Our cars never break down. The average manufacturer, this is the manufacturer, uh, in Australia would keep two or three engines in stock. So in Sydney or Melbourne, wherever they had their, their headquarters, they would have two or three engines in stock to replace at, in any op situation where a car might have gone for whatever reason. This manufacturer, the dealership that I worked for, which was a large one, the de dealership that I worked for kept eight engines in stock. Manufacturer commonly would keep about three. This dealership kept eight alone. And this is the car that was apparently the most reliable in the market. So we just need to be aware that sometimes we can be led to believe certain things that may be outside of. I'm not calling Stephen Slate a fibber, but I do think that he lays down a massive, massive challenge. So let's have a little bit of a look. Slate. We're looking at the virtual analog bundle. Now have a look up here, right up on the top of the page. I'll have a little pointy arrow. The most sonically authentic analog model plugin on the planet. But he doesn't stop there. He says, period. I mean, good on him. He's doing very well in terms of marketing. This is, this is, um, probably legally comes in under exaggeration and puffery like I am the best looking guy in the universe, perfectly legal, because it's exaggeration and puffery. If I say I am the best looking guy in Australia, that's a provable fact. And unfortunately, the first fire station that we go to, Benedict loses. But the moment I say I'm the best looking guy in the solar system, it becomes exaggeration and puffery. But nonetheless, saying that, if it's done tongue in cheek, as I just did, that's absolutely fine, thank you. Uh, but when it's done kind of, well, you know, we have the most reliable car, our cars never break down, eight engines in stock locally, then we do need to look at, is a game being run and are people gonna fall foul of the game? It doesn't mean that getting these plugins means that you're going to be getting garbage, but does it mean that what you're buying is beyond what you're getting delivered. So massive, massive claim. He then goes on and he wants to sell his all access pass. And everyone's got to come to terms with their own idea on the paying $9 or $19 a month. Uh, he's the $9 a month routine as to whether it's the path they want to go down. He lays out a set of maths but I'm not sure that it's reasonable maths. Like all of these, it's cheaper for you to pay us per month things, and I'm speaking about all of them that I've looked at, from Roland through Reason, the whole lot, they work on a false premise. And it might be okay for some who want to follow that premise, which is not a premise I encourage, but in, it only works under that premise. If I were to say, that I actually think realistically that I need 60 plus plugins, let alone premium plugins, to perform my craft. Okay, maybe it makes sense. But you know what? You don't need that many. It's actually absurd and wrong. You go ask um, Leonardo da Vinci how many, um, how many pens he used. He might have had four. I'm just making this up, but he didn't have 60 pens. This idea of that I have to have everything, including the neighbor's kitchen sink, is a false premise. We can use that to then draw a kind of logic, but it's a false premise. So he says, oh, well, you wouldn't want to buy these things individually because it would cost you too much. And then leads us down the path he wants us to go down. His business, literally his business, his right to run it the way that he wants to. But my question to you is, is the math and the premise that he's running this from really that practical? Just as we see here, that when you look at committing to a bundle, 
let's say the FG stress, built around the idea of a distressor. Um, and he shows three here. You know what's in the packet? One. This is questionable. Uh, so the idea of showing these little bundles, that's fine, because the bundle comes with one, two, three, four, five, or whatever objects. But in the real world, if we went down to our grocery store and they said, here's a two litre tub of milk, but we give the impression that you're getting three tubs of milk, that would not be okay. So please just go a little cautiously so you really understand what you are and are not getting into if you go down this or any similar path. This is not just about Slate, it's about across the board. But Slate has become a real master of this kind of approach. Right, so if you get into it and go down the path, and I'm just on the trial, uh, and I have thought at times, you know, is this a thing that I should go forward with? So I'm not immediately coming in to go, oh, I'm just going to dump on this. But I'm asking those questions both sides. That's what a real reviewer should do. Not just sit here going, oh, it's wonderful, it's great. It's to ask these harder questions. There's a lot in the bundle. There's a whole lot of extra things, like you've seen me handling Anna and the... Um, 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 uh, yeah, the Airy Q Premium. Uh, you've seen those the last couple of reviews. Plenty to recommend them as, as devices on their own. Um, but again, here you get the impression that you're getting five doohickeys. If you get the custom opto, you get one doohickey. So this is, yes, it's a nice way of making everything look consistent, but it's, so this is the download thing. You can either press the button and install absolutely everything and all this stuff floods onto your drive, which I'm not a fan of, it's overkill. You're not being selective. You're not saying which is the right tool for the job. You're just throwing everything on there. And that, oh, well, if I just keep flipping through presets, I'll probably find something that's okay. <laughs> that's not a craft. <laughs> that is just kind of randomness. And that randomness will come out in your art in the end that it will feel like, and I can pick them. You get sent stuff and you listen to this mix and you're just like, this person just flipped through presets until they got the one that go, oh, well, that sounds like Band X or whatever. <laughs> not how it's done and just not how it's done at all um so my advice would be to install one thing spend your time with it get used to it and then maybe install the next thing um so that's why my advice to say you know paying nine dollars to get a trillion things is just unwise from a craftsman's point of view but you install your things it does work but um, I'm in reason, so some things may behave a little differently, but it was not uncommon that I had to actually restart the whole computer. Um, thankfully, it's an SSD, so it's really fast. Um, but I had to commonly restart the whole computer before the plugin actually became visible and available. Some things will be under slate, so you do through your, your plugin, some of you will find under slate. Other things like this you'll find under the actual manufacturer's name, like IOSIS. Um, I know you will find under Sonic Academy. So if you go looking for them under Slate, they're not there. Um, I, I can see two sides to it, but I figure, well, Slate, if you're going to handle the whole thing, handle the whole thing so they're all in the one spot and easy to find rather than having people look all over the place. To me, it would seem like more consistent branding, but maybe that's the agreement that you have made with third party providers who are filling your box for you, your bundle for you. Right, oh, so we've had a bit of a look and a bit of a listen. Let's have a little bit of a closer look. So we come, you have some strips that they've already laid out for you, and you can navigate backwards and forwards if they go off the edge. Um, extreme strip might do, no, doesn't. Um, Yep, here, this one goes off the edge. If I click here, then it shuttles backwards and forwards. There's no little slider. They just shuttle backwards and forwards based on your thing. Uh, took me a little bit to work that out, but you get there. There is a manual and it works. Yo, you can shuffle backwards and forwards with the thing. I <laughs> didn't try that before. Uh, each of these modules does a thing. When you first come to it, the you will have this browser thing on the side with all the pictures of the doohickeys. Some people really like this. 
Um, I found it absurd because the length of travel was kind of ridiculous uh, and they're not particularly separated out into what they are. Whereas if you press this, then you get put into little sections, which you can open and close, but I didn't see the need to. Now I can run through all of those in one very quick of my finger. Um, it's also organized, so dynamics. I know that this is going to be a dynamics doohickey. If I hover, it will give me the little blurb. It's not going to be an exhaustive blurb, and each one is going to be rather positive. Um, that's fine. The um, system does work. You can, let's, let's kill off some of these guys. So actually we'll go to an empty strip. I was annoyed to start with because there was no button on here to init or start with an empty strip, just as there is no button on here to bypass the whole thing. They've probably worked indoors, which have a bypass floating around here. With reason, it's over here. I question why something like this doesn't have a broad bypass. There is a per strip bypass. If I wanted a custom opto, I can drag and drop it. I can double click and it will appear in the next available slot. And that now becomes active so long as it is switched in. You can then solo things. Um, I forgot what the A button does, and obviously you see you can delete them. They're named down here for what they are. And then you can get to work doing your do. They are apparently the world's most perfect, period, quote, uh, clones of these pieces of gear. But a lot of these pieces of gears are also hot rodded. So to say that they're a clone of and hot rodded <laughs> is kind of like saying, here's my Toyota with a Ford engine. <laughs> it's, we, it all gets a little blurry. But taking it for what it is, each of these devices has a purpose and it does seem to deliver on its purpose and it does deliver quite well within the constraints of the nature of this kind of thing. I will say that I feel like this whole system trades on the idea, and I'm also going to say possibly, in brackets, the fantasy, that this gear from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 30s, 80s, whatever, was somehow magically better than what we've got right now. Having been there, done that, you got to wonder why studios dropped a lot of this stuff. That's not to say they didn't keep some of it and don't value some of it, but when you've got big names who are mixing just in the box, it means that there isn't some inherent betternessnessnessnessnessness that is unassailable within the door environment uh, because this is not analog. This is digital. Look, you can see it's digital. It's thin. It just is digital, and that is not bad. Pretending that it's something other than it is, is a worrying mindset. It is merely a tool. It's delivered in digital, therefore it is digital. Does it feel analogy? Well, kind of in a digital sort of a way. <laughs> so it's a tool for what it is. So you can pile up your things. If you want to have an empty preset, then you can go up into settings, I think it was. Somewhere in here, there is the ability to set. Oh, okay, update with current strip. So you can right click and whatever you've got in here will get turned into one of these jump buttons. So the init isn't there, but if it's the thing you're gonna want, you can create your own init. I am far more likely to say it's wise to start with an empty strip than it is to start with a fill strip other people will feel otherwise. If you wanted to fool yourself that you've got a, um, let's say an SSL, um, assuming that there is uh, all the stuff that you need, then we could start with one of these and choose, um, I'm not sure which one of these is, probably USA, and what have you, and set the settings up, and then we could have a, I don't know, I can't, I th think that's SSL, um, definitely with the, EQ, no, not that one. I know there is one in here, um, that one. 
So we could pretend now, hypothetically, that I had an SSL. But it is pretend. I would say it's probably better to start with an empty one and say, what is the material I've got? What do I need to do to it? Because this is a mix and match. It is a Lego environment. We are not building ourselves an SSL. Um, you then just go to work. And that's it. Simple as that. You do what you want to do. Let's run through what I think are the good and bad and also to have a little bit of a go at attacking the does it meet promise. Righto. So it does sound good. In no way am I going to be negative and say that it doesn't sound good. It does sound good. Each of the modules does sound good. Each of the modules sounds and feels a little different from the others. And that is good. That was something I very much liked with, uh, with Anna too. Those filter models were all quite different from each other. This is not as dramatically different from unit to unit, uh, but most of these units were actually designed with a combination of being musical, and musical tends to be fairly consistent across the board, but also were designed to be as clean as possible. None of them were, because it's impossible to make sound that's clean anywhere in the world. Doesn't matter whether it's digital, analog, whatever. Clean sound is, is always going to be coloured. Everything we do is a compromise. Uh, but the units were actually designed to be clean, so when they're not being pushed, they should all sound kind of similar. Uh, the idea that if we uh, pulled our pair of RCAs out the back of a Neve and ran across to an SSL, that suddenly our record's going to sound completely different is naive and fantastical in the extreme. There is, yes, a tendency for stuff put through one device to obviously pick up some of the characteristics of said device based on its compromises as opposed to another device, but you know what? It's still rock and roll to me. It feels like you're getting a lot of options, and I think in many ways you kind of are. But seeing a lot of these really cover the same kind of territory, I sometimes wonder how much difference there really is that if we had one well thought through, one well designed overall device, that we probably could do it with one device rather than how many dynamics options have we got here? I don't know, eight, 10, whatever, not counting them. These could be one device. Therefore, if I wanted some of the characteristics of a FET, the fast attacks, some of the characteristics of an opto, the release or whatever, that I should be able to put them together. Now, I know such devices exist, and that's a personal choice, that I would probably go down the one device than the 47 devices that are all a little bit of a one-trick pony. They are all good devices in their own way. They all do their job, but... You feel like there's a lot of options, but I think there are some issues with that. It is very feel-oriented, and that is good in some ways, because we're not being asked to mix with our eyes. And there's a lot of tendency. You saw me, the video before, where I mixed something with my eyes and ended up with a vile result. These old-school kinds of things have very little eye mixing involved with them, they are far more about feel. And that is a good thing, especially for people who've grown up in a very eyes-dominant door environment. So there's been a lot of fashion lately with analog obsession and all these people making these little clones of gear that we apparently are very upset to not have access to. Very happy to be rid of the damn things. Um, and it's changing the way that people are approaching their mixing because they're going back to doing it the way that they should have been doing it in the first place. And if that's what's really happening, then that's a good thing too. The bad. As you can tell, I feel like the whole thing is rather novelty driven. We could just have one beautifully designed device that doesn't need to look like some dusty old piece of gear with somebody's fingerprints on it so that we can pretend that we're Sir George Martin um, and then we've got John Lennon over in the corner chewing gum and Paul McCartney spitting in John's hair or whatever. You know, it's, there's a fantasy around this. It, it bothers me. Um, for something that pitches itself so high and so hard, I got to say, I had no idea where my levels were. 
And I know that levels in VU environments are different, but at no point would I say that I felt like there was a set of meters, there are no meters in this thing at all, to tell me, A, whether I've gained level. Because plenty of these things, when you put them in, gain level, which automatically makes them sound good. Easiest way to be a sound goodifier, add a couple of dB. People don't notice the couple of dB, they go, oh, it just suddenly sounds better, it's more, because it's louder. Um, we've got no way of actually checking our levels in to out. Um, not that it's a killer, because I don't spend my time level matching things, um, but it's a known thing that you do need to be careful when you AB, that all you need to do is add a couple of dB and it sounds better, and you'll go, oh, I'll go with that. So people very easily will be drawn down the path of laddening, 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 getting into their mixes or just to expletive deleted lad. So it's very unclear what your levels are, what you're actually doing. And yes, a lot of that analog gear was like that, but seeing we have the option that this is digital, then why do we at least not have a doohickey? You know, the, the, the mastering thing, put in the, the mastering device, I got no idea what's happening there, really. Um, so I'm having to go back and rely on my doors meters. And that's fine, because I would anyway, but seeing this is the best thing ever, the promise is made, um, why does it let me encourage myself to master when I've got no way of checking my mastering? That sort of thing. And I also got to say, and people will say this isn't a valid thing to say, and I'm going to cover both sides of it, is that it really kind of bugged me, bearing in mind I'm coming from reason where everything's very interchangeable. If I want to delay before my drive, if I want to delay before my saturation, or delay saturation, more delay, I can just do it. Uh, whereas here... We've got these little modules that we can put in, but the problem is if I want to put in something that's not just a mixing desk kind of a thing, I have to go outside, do it, and then come back in. And while Slate has brought in other things, so if I want a delay, I guess I can go to what's got a delay? Kilohertz, that's in the bundle. Um, but you know what? It's not the same as why are there not at least basic, nice, workable little doohickeys along those lines in here? That people will go, oh, but if you know, if you want that kind of stuff, just go out to the uh, to the Overloud THU, go to KHS, or any of that kind of stuff. But I also think this feels, in some ways, to me a little incomplete. But I think I would probably feel the same whichever manufacturer I looked at going down this path. And they would probably say, but you wouldn't have a delay in the middle. But you know what? When I've got my mixing desk in front of me, if I had a real SSL here, I'd be just leaning across and twisting the send more delay, send more reverb knob on the desk. See my point? That you're extracting it out. You're taking only a little bit, the bit that you want to do. And, and that's your right. But they're, they're, the, they're the things that bother me. So answering the question... Is this the bestest analog model plugins on the planet, period? Stupid question. They're analog. They're not analog. They're digital. It's all digital. It's a form of exaggeration and puffery that, in my opinion, goes far too close to pretending to be real, to be fair or comfortable. Um, if you like the sound of them, brilliant. But if you go around pretending or allowing yourself to be drawn down the path of like, oh, but if I insert this, then I have got that. I guess you're welcome to what happens at that point. Because you do not have a distressor. You do not have uh, an LA-2A. You do not have a whatever any of these things are. You absolutely do not. You have a digital device that skinned to look like it, and might to some extent behave like it. But it is not that thing. If you start from the basis of feeling fooled, like if you go, Ooh, I met this girl, she's super pretty, therefore she's nice. Does the arrangement of her face actually define her character? I think we all know that there are some girls who are mighty hot and real hard to live with. Just as there are some guys who are mighty buff, just like me, 
but mighty hard to live with. So I, I don't think that his promise, his expectation, um, either in the promise of being more analog than everybody else uh, and that somehow he's saving you vast amounts of money by your pumping money into his pocket every month. I think they're all built on some less than solid premises. I think they are built on premises of sand. And it doesn't mean that you can't enjoy his product or find his product really suited to your workflow, but seeing the promises are put forward so emphatically, then I think they should be looked at and Emotionally, I feel uncomfortable with this stuff. All right, let's move to stage two. Part two. Here I will actually walk through a song. I actually sang this one. This one um, is something of mine I did for a training exercise on songwriting. Um, it went, it's gone by various names, Doom Song <laughs> um, and the like. I've just ended up calling Doom here. Uh, it's a song where I made up the lyrics as I was singing them. It is garbage. Uh, but I was proving the point that the idea of composing um, using a simple chord structure will apply regardless of what genre that you're in. So I said, okay, let's go outside of the box rather than doing something that sounded singer-songwriter because I'd just done one of them, that we could apply this to a more extreme genre that people might go, but the rules don't apply there. And to show that they'd work just as well there, you can make it easy. Here's the song. And this is all done with as much as possible slate stuff. So we've got his drums. We've got his mixer stuff all the way through it, um, his verb suite classic uh, through it. Um, synths are um, actually Europa because I wasn't going to change them. They already existed. Revoicing wasn't really going to prove anything. Uh, the bass is the um, ample sound uh, bass because uh, this was originally designed to be done mostly with uh, free devices. Oh, and the guitars are courtesy of the rather unusual uh, Wedge Force Matcher, which is a kooky device, uh, but if you work with it, it actually manages to have some interesting charms. And all processing is done by Slate where possible, with the exception of things like delays, because as I said, he doesn't have them. So let's dip into the track. basically goes along like that. We'll start with the drums, because I know that's where you'll want to start with. Now this is Doom. If you're not familiar with the form of Doom um, or Sludge, um, then you may sort of wonder why it's like this. It's a very slow form of, well, sadly these days more post-blues, um, metal, which can also include um, often southern rock. But in my form, it's more of the classic old form of doom, which was a kind of metal which borrowed a lot from the first Sabbath record, first Black Sabbath record, uh, and was commonly going on in, in northern Europe. So acts like Candlemas and uh, what have you, slowing it down, starting again. We have, let's just turn off all our processing for the moment drums. Oh, and of course, this reverb. Plenty of reverb, because the idea is a big, sort of slow, heavy, lumbering kind of a beast. We do also have a delay line in here. It's one of my own. It's designed to double. The kit to make it sound bigger. So now it then comes to what did I do in terms of slate? Uh, 
I'm not going to go into what every single device does because that's for you to, to work out and besides we'll be here forever. But I started with a compressor and seeing I've never had opportunity to use a distressor uh, and they are apparently amazing, I thought okay let's throw this at this and see if I get amazing out. And yeah I kind of do. Does this sound or behave like a distressor? Not going to get into that at all because as I keep saying to you I don't see it as relevant. However, the distressor has a reputation of you being able to hurl stuff at it far harder than you could should, and it gives you some really nice results. And I think this does that. Oh, wait, we're getting up to 14 dB of gain reduction, and it just sounds more authoritative without sounding squished. Uh, the ratio appears to be 6 to 1, which is pretty heavy-handed. Um, didn't really play with any of these things. To be perfectly honest, I don't think I played much with anything here uh, because it just sounded great when I put it in. Now, that does not mean that you should do that, but it was like, that's cool. I'm not going to mess with that because I'm happy with what I have. I do remember wiggling the knobs, but I think they ended up kind of where they were because in this case, it worked very nicely. And see how we're really embiggening those that slate kit. Now these are very cumulative. So this soloed is not going to give us the same result as this into this. This is a Neve style pre, and we are pushing this. Yeah, how the, the, the metal works, a little chicken wiry, we're pushing this. Not so much that you're going to go, oh, that's distorted, but it's, it's made to seem really quite large. And then through an EQ. It's pretty subtle. We're just looking to enhance a little bit of some stuff pulled out some in the um, in the mids there, or the low-ish mids. Um, popped into the drive mode, don't know whether that made any difference, to be honest. Um, but overall... We did embiggen our sound. We loudened our sound, but we did embiggen our sound. I better have that back on. Because that's an important part of it, that the really tight slapback day, delay is like we're in a big room. Bass. So hear how that's put a lot of grunt on it. Yes, AC sounds pretty brutal in here. Or oh, must be an EQ thing then. Rockstar, go watch it. If you're serious about music and you haven't watched Rockstar, you're letting yourself down. So we put in, it's called the Bomber. Must be good. Says that it will kind of to add to anything. So I hit it and I hit it pretty hard. And it does add a feeling of brutality. Plus it brings up a lot of uh, the, the sort of mids. So it's putting a lot more presence into the unit. Um, I, I stayed with tight because the last thing I want, even though presence and fat sounded good, the last thing I want is for that bass to flub all over the place because I've got those guitars which are everywhere. Uh, and then it was into uh, an EQ, which is working to bring more clarity. We're pushing the bass a little bit, but we're really aiming to bring those mids and the highs because it's got to cut through the mix. So, before, nice. Now the rhythm bus, you know, I always work with my rhythm stuff into a bus as, as a rule. Without, with. 
Now again, you can see we are adding level, but I just don't really mix by level matching everything. If I'm really worried, then I will say, okay, I'm gonna go back and level match. I just focus on getting the sound that I want. If it feels good, I'm happy that it's good, but I've been doing this for 30 years. So I would always caution beginners because otherwise they will just add 3 dB, go sounds better and not have actually addressed whether it's going to work better. Once you've got a lot of experience behind you, some people will get that experience in a couple of months because they're a natural. Some of them will take decades to get that experience. But once you've got the experience, you can just tell what's going to work, what's going in the right direction. Yes, thank you. Uh, versus, yeah, look, I'm just kind of fooling myself on this. This is using that custom opto, and I'm just looking to push that drums and bass together. And I went with the aggro mode because it does punch a little harder. I just want not a lot of compression here. I think it's only about 2 dB, but that's about all I do on buses. Uh, it's just to get it grooving together and using a little bit of whatever's happening in here. I think I left it at, yeah, it's just at 100%. So whatever saturation is going on in there, that's what I've brought in, and it does, it does work nicely. So we've now got the core of our track. Organ, actually the organ comes later, but we might as well do him now. So we're getting quite a bit of drive from a Leslie effect and then pushing a lot more through with these. I'll just pull them out one by one. I'm aware that it's distorting, but I actually want it to. It needs to feel really edgy. A, um, a Doom mix that sounds clean in the sense that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have rough edges is going to not sound the best. There, there should be some sense of rough edges. This, I struggled with, put it into this. So it's really the two of them together, looking to get the sense that this is just slightly overpowering a preamp. I'm not looking for more distortion, I've got it. And to be perfectly blunt, I didn't find anything in here that I necessarily thought at least easily was going to make a nice distortion unit, which I sort of thought was a bit sad. Now that's not to say that we can't overpower these units. You know, add a lot of level here and add a lot of level here and add a lot of level here until we're really overpowering these units. Um, there's nothing to say you can't or shouldn't do that, and to some extent that's what I have done here, but they tend to go from kind of adding something nice to adding something nasty, <laughs> very, very small margin. So I just kept that just to this side, well, mostly of keeping it nice. And then EQ. The EQ there is actually pulling certain things out, not because they're bad, simply because this is not a lead sound. Seems like it at the moment, but it's not a lead sound. It's just to fill out the mix and add a little bit more spark to what's going on by the time we're going around again. So with, with that, we have dropped a lot of level. And again, I had no problems with that because I was actually using the outputs of this rather than my faders. I'd rather get what I think is the right level at my devices before I bring them up to my faders. Um, happy enough with the sound that I've got. Now let's do guitars. Someone's gonna be saying, well, if you're doing Slate, why weren't you using their Overlad thing? Yeah, brought it in, didn't like it. That's not to say that it's bad. I am not reviewing it. Um, I've been asked to review it and I declined because a, I'm not a guitarist, so I'm going to put synths through it, which I don't think is really very fair for people who are going, how's it going to sound on my guitar? Unless I'm specifically asked, 
can we review this from a synthesis perspective? Uh, the other problem that I have is it's based on impulse responses and I am just not a fan of those. So I have stayed with my scream. If you think it sounds like garbage, that's your business. That's not the point here. I'm chasing a unique sound far more like would have happened in the day because the idea that what people say those records sounded like is not the same as what was actually on tape. Uh, if you want to check, go listen to um, some country, um, the hag, uh, Merle Haggard. Uh, go have a listen to some of his stuff. Electric guitar solos that sound like a cow mooing. It's a sound that people would say you can't do that. But you know what? The hag sold plenty of record, including with the fact that his cow sound, his guitar sounded like a cow mooing. So unique guitar sounds, deliberate. Again, put through that slapback delay as though this is happening in a, in a fairly big room. I can't hear much difference in these headphones here at all. To be honest, uh, I felt like I was hearing difference when I was mixing it on, on speakers, but in the headphones, it, I'm hearing very little difference with a lot of these in the in-out. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm saying they did nothing. It's just I can't speak about it a lot from personal experience because at the moment I can't live it. But I pushed a little bit of saturation again twice, actually three times. All I did was I wanted to take the somewhat challenging, oh sorry, the neighbors decided they need to do some circular soaring again, um, the somewhat interesting, unique scream sound and see if this kept its promise of analogizing stuff. In the cans, I can't say. I was happy with the mix when I was using speakers. So in no way would I say that I was unhappy with the sound that I got. So one guitar, two guitar. Same process, except it does have a resonator. That's from KHS, Kilohertz. That's just a, because I'm using the same guitar for two different positions. Uh, I'm gonna make sure that these two guitars sound different from one another with more than just saying, oh, I'll EQ them differently. If I had, Tipton and Downing in the room, assuming that were possible, then they probably aren't playing the very same guitar. Well, they could, but I doubt that they're going to turn up with one guitar between them and hand it backwards and forwards. They're probably each going to turn up with two different guitars, a Jackson and a Schechter, or a Strat and a Les Paul, and then proceed to fight with each other. Don't know, don't care, um, but making sure that my guitar sounds, while similar, do not sound the same as each other. So. Again, I'm not getting a feeling of hearing much difference in these. I felt like there was more there. I've just added this fella, some more overall saturation. I do think that I'm feeling a little bit more presence. And um, that's just largely what I wanted, the feeling of, of that kind of presence, which nice gear will do. Uh, and the whole idea of a little bit of saturation and loggy presence realism sort of thing. Yep, we are getting that. So doing its job. They then go into a guitar bus. I've pulled back my levels here again, rather than doing it on the desk. I've gotten the, the, the main pullback to where I think they should be here, and then just finessed it on the desk at the end. And I kept pulling these guitars back because I kept having them, um, what seemed like the right thing, and then come back going, oh my God, they just overwhelmed the mix. Um, so whether they're right or wrong, don't know. It's not about judging my mixing, just about saying, okay, what do we get A to B? <laughs> Thank you. 
rolling off some fizz here because they are prone to being a little fizzy, as is the nature of guitars. When Jake brings me his guitar work through his Black Star amp, which is a nice little amp, respectful amp, uh, respectable amp, uh, then I'm commonly getting rid of fizz from the recording process. Um, that's normal we, when we're pushing a little bit of boost. So you see we're pushing it about two and a half and pulling back from above three. So just giving them that kind of raunch but making sure they're not fizzing on top because Reason is different from a lot of doors in that it doesn't seem to do anything to change your sound. It's brutally honest. It's like the NS10 of doors. Other doors um, do not sound quite the same as what you put into them. If you do nothing, yeah, you, you can get null tests and all of that's fine, not questioning that, but they do tend to smooth out the sound in some way. That's fine. Tape altered the sound quite a lot. Um, but when I use other doors, I often feel like I'm running to try and resolve all the changes that it made without my permission. Whereas in Reason, you're kind of running the other way in that you're saying, okay, this is exactly what I put in. And now I've got to turn it into what I want it to be. I prefer that method, but I know a lot of people want that done for them. <laughs> So just a desk sound, a little bit of saturation, pulling back quite a lot of level here. Uh, just wanted that little bit of saturation to pull the two guitars together. They need to sound like they belong together. Uh, so I haven't used any compression here because I rarely compress guitars. Guitars rarely need compression because drive just brutalizes their dynamics already. It doesn't say you can't, but you, you just want to be careful going down that path. And I'm happy with the sound. Brings us to the vocal. Most talented singer ever. By we bypass everything. Of so this is completely dry. And we zero. Hello. Delay. By the night, reverse. Saved. And again, remember that's the, uh, the 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 reverb that comes in the slate thing. There is another reverb as well. So I didn't try as a third party thing, uh, but I downloaded that to try to say, well, I'll use as much slate as I feel comfortable using. The guitar stuff, as I said, just didn't feel comfortable using it was just kind of like that's somebody else's sound I, i'm not getting my sound i want my sound you know when i mix i'm looking for the sound that i want that i feel that the track wants and the overlad stuff sounded very like somebody else's idea of what it should sound like and now let's look at adding in the virtual mix the night of you notice there's a lot more presence, a lot more brightness, sparkle, and air. So we've got in order and we an LA 2A style compressor. Zero. Hello. Just looking to do what they're famous for and what I normally use the ADHD leveling tool for, which is to keep a pretty even sort of a level um, because this is a little up and down. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Just compression, that's it, doing its job. It behaves how I would expect it to. Did it bring any magic? Didn't but expect it to. I... This EQ, I don't think it's supposed to be built around anything. Um, flat, we've added a bit at about 4K, so that's a lot of that cutting presence. I wouldn't normally boost a vocal at about 4K because it's prone to being a little papery, but seeing we've got this such a messy background <laughs> going on, we want this to pull forward and it's not the brightest, clearest of vocals. Um, it just isn't. Uh, it, so this brings some of that. 
um, add a little bit of body. Yes, normally, again, I would not be boosting a, a singer around that point, but I wanted to feel doomy. You might have noticed as I put in the effects that it's just sort of pulling a lot of low <sighs> through the mix. And that's actually deliberate as a choice in this case to say, I want it to sound huge. I want it to sound like frightening and scary. Um, high pass, actually haven't rolled anything off in this case. Uh, and then the air. By the night of doom. Yes, there's probably some distortion in there that, where that came from. Don't know, don't care. I'm off to the overview. I don't think anybody's fussing too much about the words. They're rubbish anyway. Uh, this is the Iosis, Iosis um, Air component from their EQ, separated out. And it does work really rather nicely to bring a lot of presence in, uh, more so perhaps than one of the other devices. There's a the CS Lift does do that, but I think the Air might do it nicer, but I'm not saying either is right or wrong. So given that a, a three and a half dB, it's a reasonable amount of pedal, as you hear it just because it's such a, a messy sound with the guitars and everything else and the, the metal work and what have you, then we need to make sure that that vocal comes forward because if it doesn't, it just becomes muddy with all that deliberate murk that I've put on the bottom end. Zero. Zero. So it's adding a lot of detail like hearing my throat um, and that leads us down to, it seems to take away the presence of the Merc, but it, inside the mix will allow it to pull forward, which means that we, our brain can track back to all that Merc underneath. Say. So here how that's really helping to pull my vocal through, giving it a lot of personal character in the sense that we're hearing, we feel like we're hearing inside the throat, uh, as well as just subconsciously being aware of all this murk, like um, dark, dank fog in the creepy woods in which I am singing. Uh, so that gives us a full mix. Let's just turn this off. Probably should have room to turn that off before. So again, it's a combination of things. Put in one device, gun, okay, I think that's as far as I wanna go with this device. Trying to get every, all the way there with one device is, is, is a big mistake. So we've put in um, 1176 clone. Um, uh, that's just, that's just a straight clone. They've got other versions of it. Um, and just looked to manage our Impression. you'll see that there it's not doing a lot. It's behaving pretty mildly. I don't want this to feel any more compressed than it already does. Everything is quite compressed because saturators do a lot of compression. Uh, and so the more you use a saturator, the less you need to use a compressor. If you don't want to use a saturator, you're going to need to use a compressor more if you want to compress sound. Whereas if you want that 
um, you know, Rod Stewart from 1976 kind of record, um, uh, Night on the Tarn, beautiful, beautiful record. Then it was made with this kind of gear, analog, not digital. Um, and so <laughs> the limited bandwidth, the, um, the saturation, everything was just absorbing spiky dynamic bits. So the compression was nowhere near the amount of compression that's used on very digital EDM. Oh. This guy. This is a kind of EQ, basically. Uh, so you can put top on, they call it shimmer. Uh, so we're adding some, ooh, and you can make it sound a little thicker. I believe it's an EQ based in part on saturation. So it's a, it's a kind of a dual saturator. Um, unlike the, um, the air, fresh air thing, which I just didn't find a way to love, this was kind of cool. Um, but there is still a tendency perhaps to go a little over bright, but bearing in mind at the time, brightness was a real difficulty where every time you put something to tape or every time you put something through a device, you lost brightness. Adding brightness back in was a big deal back in the 70s and 80s. And then once you got into the 80s, suddenly adding so much brightness wasn't such a big deal, but they kept doing it. And we ended up with these beautifully bright, incredibly brilliant records. Um, so Cliffy Bastard, um, Carrie, um, We Don't Talk Anymore, Some People, wonderfully bright, bright records. Um, it was a combination of the fact that suddenly tape and devices were able to handle all this extra without rolling it off, and there was still just that tendency to be doing all this stuff. Um, I like that time still, I, I love those records. Uh, but this adds a bit of a oomph and a bit of brightness, and then I've just decided, okay, how do I want to do this in the end? And to be blunt, in the end, I didn't EQ anything. I just wanted to roll off. So I wanted a high pass. So I've just inserted this. I would probably rather have had something where I could see what was going on, but I was not using meters. There was no meters, no um, spectrum analyzers or anything like that going on here. It was ears only, and that's designed to do that job. So I pressed the button and it does. It does actually do the job. I checked it with meters after. And then this guy. Trimmer is designed to give you your final level. So it is it is a limiter, whether it's a full um, brick wall, I don't know because, well, there doesn't seem to be any way of knowing, but there does seem to be a foot meter. Again, for something that, that says how pro and what have you it is, why we're not given nicer metering stuff that we can trust you know stuff that that uh, that we can just denote as the god of our uh, our project i really don't get you know if it's pro why is it not giving me these things is it assuming that my door does it now if it's assuming that everybody runs reason yeah why would you bother i never put a meter on anything because reason's main metering is great you know this uh this fella up the top I'll follow that to hell and back. But most doors <laughs> have no idea what's going on, which was common back in the day, really was common back in the day. But seeing we don't need to be that way, it's like why is there not either a module or simply an extra bit on the side that gives us bulletproof metering? I'm not talking about luffs or any of that kind of, well, stuff. Um, put it in if you want but just good, honest, honest, honest metering that we can trust. Because you know what? Most doors don't have it. So that would be a good thing. That's actually worth real money. Um, overall, I am pleased with this mix. I think it sounds good. Sounds meaty. Those guitars, they've got their really unique sound. The um, the slate stuff hasn't done anything to hide them. As I say in the cans, I can't really hear the AB difference, but on um, the speakers, I felt like, oh, yep, I've, I've added a bit to them. Um, I would have done some drive if there were real drive units within the slate thing, and I kind of think, 
why wouldn't you do that? Um, because I just really didn't want to go down the overload path THU uh, because, well, maybe I could get the sound that I wanted, but flipping through it to start with, what I'm hearing is how to sound like, um, who was it? I can't remember. I don't think it was Cap called Caparoon. Someone who coined this term vanilla sausage. What I felt like was I was hearing that exact formula no matter which way I turned, you know, not a preset guy, but if I loaded up this this um, supposed rig, it was kind of like, okay, it's that sound again. Um, and then, of course, as I say, the, the whole impulse response thing just does not float my boat. I think that's part of that sound. It's like how to sound like every other band who's got exactly the same approach. Um, so being able to use the virtual mix rack to really change my guitar sound wasn't necessarily what it was designed for didn't feel like I got that result maybe I also don't know the, the stuff well enough to have pulled out the magical thing maybe I should have thrown distresses or, or the bomb at them to to bring out something different but I also really like that guitar tone it's like oh that's unique um, so overall bottom line Slate's virtual mix thing comes in with a massive sense of promises, probably far greater than is, well, my idea of entirely honorable. Uh, I think it's gonna lead people to a different idea, and so therefore I think there's a certain amount of flummery there, which I think is disappointing. Great for Stephen's bank account, great for his bank account, great for those who want to feel like, well, I've bought the thing, so therefore I've landed like people who buy that particular car brand, which is renowned for blowing engines and gearboxes uh, within the industry, but they feel like they have got the very best thing in the world and proceed to drive like... <laughs> make Volvo drivers look good. Uh, I'm approaching it as like, what have we actually got? All we've got on the ground is, is kind of cool, but also kind of limited, and I also feel a little misdirected. But if you get it and you go, this is a path I'm going down and I'm going to commit myself to it, then I think it's possible to do very, very nice work with it. So long as you are learning to master it, not sitting there going, oh, well, I'll just put this in because an 1176 will automatically make everything sound pro, because that is just so much BS, I got to say. Uh, because there were plenty of recordings done, definitely in the mid 80s, where records, um, recording studios were reasonably easy to get to. You, your band could front up with $500 and go and record a song or an EP. Um, and the gear used would be a lot of this kind of stuff that was old. Um, but those records didn't necessarily sound great. They sounded like exactly what the band had prepared and the quality of the recording and mix engineer, particularly the quality of the mix engineer, because most of the time they didn't actually hire a mix engineer. They let the guy in the studio tell them that, oh yes, I will mix this for you. And yes, you will. But that's what's called a guide mix. And that's fine if, if you can only afford the $500 and you're gonna go with that, but then those bands would turn around and go, this doesn't really feel like our insert band here. It's not like the cure or the police or the church or, you know, and that was simply because even though this kind of gear that's being name dropped here was actually being used because it was there in the studios, uh, it came down to that the records sounded poor because, well, tape sounds poor, but answer to cassette sounds worse. Uh, and they didn't hire a mix engineer or a proper mix engineer. Being able to just put the levels up and say, okay, there you go, that can go out the door, doesn't blow your, blow your, uh, your VU meters, that's the real issue. Getting somebody who really knows how to mix, how to bring that magic out of your track, doesn't matter what gear is used at that point because they're gonna bring out the magic. If you want to use Slate and his system, which is pretty, and does sound good. If you want to use this as your path, then there is absolutely no reason that you cannot be getting great work. But don't feel like if you choose this path over the other path for the other person who tells you that they've got the bestest thing ever, there's no difference. It's just whichever one you want to believe or whichever one you like the workflow of better. You know, if this 
only forced me to look at things this way, I would have found that incredibly off-putting and it would have been a serious negative from my point of view. The fact that I could do this made life so much easier that I didn't have to stick looking at the thing I didn't want to see. Or you can get rid of that altogether. And initially I was going to because I found it super annoying that this thing was sitting here the whole time. Like, So little things like that can be enough to make somebody choose, I'll go this path rather than that path. Because you know what? There really is very, very, very little difference from one to another. Because as I showed with um, something else recently, um, oh, the IOSIS EQ, I was able to, once I'd gotten an EQ curve set up in that, I was able to clone that using a stock digital device. Uh, so there's no, this can do something that something else can't. And to suggest that is Pinocchio nosing. Uh, but if you particularly like what Slate's doing, and to be fair, if you have a door and you don't want to use any of the stuff that's in it, for whatever reason, either because it, well, it is garbage in some of them, a couple of them really are just like, what were you doing with those devices you included? Or they just, for whatever reason, don't float your boat. Then you could say, okay, I've got a door that has, doesn't have any synths or any mixing effects worth anything, uh, to me at least, uh, therefore I will just buy into the Slate universe, in which case you get a really, really great synth, another really, really great synth, you get a whole pile of mixing doohickeys, you do get a very highly featured guitar cabinet rig thing, which I think if you're after that sound will do really well, if you put time and energy into it maybe you can make really unique sounds out of it as well, I, I, I don't know but it's there, um, you get access to um, quite a lot of different types of EQs. You might find one that really floats your boat. And then of course there's the Iosis, which is a very, very interesting mistress to take on. Um, and there's probably other bits and pieces, but you could say, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. But if you do go down that path, my advice is put aside all the stocky devices, which you've probably mentally done already, and then put aside everything else that's not this, and you just go slate and you use everything that's in there, maybe one thing at a time. Possibly say, okay, I don't need synths right now, so you don't install it. Yeah, don't install it. You'd be like, but well, why am I paying for it? And that's part of my question, why would you be paying for it? Uh, and then bring in the devices as you need them. The um, all these little modules, they just install in one go. So you're gonna have them all there anyway. That's, if you've paid for the whole box and dice, the whole box and dice is there. Uh, there is some stuff with microphone stuff. I just closed it down because you need to have his physical microphone thing. And as I said before, I, I don't know that I would have much truck with that. You'd have to make your own piece as to whether you're gonna go that far down the path with Stephen Slate hand in hand. Overall, for what it is, if you accept it for what it is and the way it works, it is a very interesting package of very pretty things. Um, personally, I find it scattered. Um, but if you want to work this way, uh, and there are advantages in that it forces you, to, forces you to be a lot more ears only, then it definitely has its charms and there is nothing wrong with the sound at all. It will do what it would say on the tin if it hadn't then put a hyperbole banner on top of it. If it simply said, we've got a lot of very nice doohickeys that look like old fashioned doohickeys, you can do nice work with our doohickeys, then I would be a lot less snarky about it. If you have any questions, not about about how to troubleshoot Slate or anything like that, but just in general about this program, ask him on down below, preferably after hitting the uh, subscribe button. You can also pop over to hirehertz.com for a different uh, stream of information. Um, yeah, or if you're gonna ask a, a mix question about, oh, my mix this, my mix that, I need to be able to see and hear it. 
So that means grab something like OBS, which you're watching me use right now, make a screen recording. You can always make it a less than public video, not private because then I can't see it, but you can unlist it so people won't stumble on it and put that link in your question because if I can't see and hear it properly, and properly means that taking photos of your screen or wandering around your studio like this whilst your phone judges around the screen and listens to your loudspeakers. No, it's not proper. If, if I can get it proper quality, then I'll have a listen. But just bear in mind, if you're chasing a mix engineer to do work for you, it's a paid thing. But I don't mind helping people with broader questions. Just give me what I need to be able to do the job properly for you. You have a great day now.